of the applicant as a speaker first, whether or not you have the capacity to determine this matter. The speaker underscore, the speaker I shall rely on order 13.2 of the rules of this house to say that you are so well fortified to consider this matter. Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, I shall read Order 13 through, which provides, whenever the House is informed by the clerk at table of the unavoidable absence of Mr. Speaker, the first Deputy Speaker shall perform the duties and exercise the authority of Mr. Speaker in relation to all proceedings of the House until Mr. Speaker resumes the chair without any further communication to the House. Mr. Speaker, rightly so. The clerk at table has informed us that Mr. Speaker is unavoidably absent and that by that imperative, you are well fortified to assume the full duties, mandate, power, responsibilities, as though you are the Speaker of the House. So, Mr. Speaker, you are fortified to consider this application. Mr. Speaker, second, it is right, it is right that the constitutional provision relied on by the applicant clearly gives us the number required to be present in this chamber for the purposes of taking decision in Parliament. And Mr. Speaker, one half of Parliament will be 138. For the avoidance of doubt, the record in our votes clearly states that Mr. Speaker in the chair had indicated that there were a number 137 zero saying yes. Meaning, Mr. Speaker, that at that moment in time, we did not have 138 present. Which Mr. Speaker, Article 104.1 is also very clear that when that minimum number is present, the decision must be based on the majority of those present to take a decision. And Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, I shall read that aloud. Except as otherwise provided in this constitution, matters in parliament shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting, with at least half of all the members of parliament present. So, Mr. Speaker, the net effect is that one, the threshold of 138 must be met, and that in that 138, majority of them would now be required to take a decision. Mr. Speaker, having made these contentions, I beg to say that, Mr. Speaker, this constitutional imperative clearly vitiates that which took place. And now, Mr. Speaker, on all fours, the applicant motion is well rooted. And, Mr. Speaker, the invitation made to you on all fours is right, and I therefore, Mr. Speaker, without any hesitation, implore you, Mr. Speaker, to give favorable consideration to this application. Mr. Speaker, I so submit, and I thank you. It's very regrettable that there's nobody on the minority bench. Indeed, we've been engaging a leadership of the House, expanded leadership, from 9 a.m. We closed at 2.30 to give ourselves one hour to have lunch and to resume at 3.30. Uh, I have no information why nobody on the other side is here, but we clearly agreed 
that Parliament will sit at 3.30. It was a meeting at which the leadership on the minority was present, and we have had discussions from morning up to this time. So it's a pity there's nobody here so I could hear their views on the motion before me. But as has been pointed out um, under Order 1091, let me read for emphasis. No question for a decision in the House shall be proposed for determination unless they are present in the House, not less than one half of all members of the House. And except otherwise provided in the Constitution, the question proposed shall be determined by a majority of votes, members present and voting. So before I take any decision, I want to confirm that I have a majority of members of Parliament in the Chamber. May the clerks at table assist me by how we're going to do it, call out names or members. You go around and count the members. One of members, the number presented to me by the clerks at table is 137 of you plus me, MP for the choir, 138. <laughs> members the motion that was moved by the Honorable Minister and have been debated is now ready for a decision to be taken. We have already determined that the appropriate numbers are in the chamber and therefore the House stands ready to take a decision. Now I'll put the question. All in favor of the House adopting the resolution moved by the Honorable Minister for Finance say aye. All against say no. The eyes of it. The House has accordingly approved the budget statement of for the ensuing year ending 20, 31st December 2022.
Hello, good evening. Welcome to this edition of Good Evening Ghana. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, tonight, we are, we are all just coming in, isn't it? It's been a long day in Parliament, and we will be explaining in great detail what happened in Parliament tonight. The big story, uh, uh, the photograph behind me, the Right Honourable Speaker, Alban Bagbin, whose decision in Parliament to put the question was completely nullified today. Uh, and that you've just shown you an eight-minute video of Alexander Afenyo Makin, the erudite um, deputy majority leader from Winneba, who uh, seconded the motion for a rescission of uh, the decision on Friday, where the speaker put the question with 137 people. So what happened in Parliament tonight is what we're going to start with as we welcome into the studio uh, Abdullah Jinapur, the Honorable Minister for Lands and Forestry, who is also the Honorable Member of Parliament for the Damongo constituency for the New Patriotic Party. Mr. Jinapur was in Parliament all day tonight, today, and tonight he'll be bringing to us what actually uh, happened and what actually occurred. Okay, <laughs> interesting times. Our responsibility will be to share with you the gossip of what we found uh, through our reporters speaking to different people in the minority and majority side. We'll be telling you what our gossip uh, uh, platforms have brought us since 8 o'clock in the morning, what was happening in Parliament, culminating in the sitting of Parliament at 3.30. Parliament should have started at 10 o'clock. They began at 3.30 because since 8 o'clock, majority and minority have been negotiating. We'll tell you what the major minority brought on board and then what the majority brought on board. Later on, the minority leader, uh, uh, minority leader Honorable Aruna Idris, a member of Parliament for Tamale South, also addressed the press conference, assisted by the Honorable Mubarak Muntaka Mohammed, the member of Parliament for Asamwase constituency in Ashanti for the NDC. He's the chief whip of the minority. Both of them addressed the press and will bring you the video so you can see it and if evaluate is for yourself. But it looks like uh, at the end of the battle that began on Friday to approve the budget, the uh, NPP, the majority by one, have succeeded in doing so. What did they do today? What are the numbers? What does the law say? We'll tell you all of that. I'll be asking questions of Abu Jinapo, who is going to give us a cogent historical perspective from the Hansard, as he's told me about these matters. Uh, now, though, we decorated a beautiful montage uh, we have a decorated montage that we put together for the National Democratic Congress about this matter. Uh, here it is. It is just a joke. Because there has been a walkout, I want a head count. So that we get to know the number in the House and whether we satisfy the constitutional requirements of taking a decision, which we know, the core of the House to take a decision. Quorum of the House. Please, table office, do the counting. Honorable members, you may now resume your seats. The results, 137. The results, 137. Victory, victory, it's our land. 
Because there has been a walkout, I want a head count so that we get to know the number in the House and whether we satisfy the constitutional requirement of taking a decision, which we know the core of the House to take a decision. Quorum of the House. Please, table office, do the counting. Honorable members, you may now resume your seats. The results 137. The results, 137. Okay, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for your time. So we're going to let you into the gossip about what happened. Okay, so you already know what happened on Friday, and then uh, it had been largely found out that what happened on Friday was unconstitutional, it was illegal, because the magic uh, number is 138. And uh, so there's 137 and there's 138. It is historic that in an African country's parliament, the difference between the majority and the minority is a single one, and nobody yet has drawn knives. I think that all of what is happening is an advertisement for Ghana's democracy. We should never lose sight of that. I think the Ministry of Tourism should highlight it and let people who watch CNN know that Ghana has a democracy that can match any democracy in tolerance and in development and in organization. Because this, is, this only happens in the Western world. We see that happen in the Western world. We don't think it's possible in Africa. Here is an African country that has a majority, that has a majority by one with a lot of rancor and debate and anger, but it's happening. So since last Friday, the minority and the majority have been divided. On Friday, the majority walked out of parliament and occasioned uh, a vote uh, on two motions. The Minister for Finance, the Honorable Ken Oforiata, had presented a motion before the Speaker, and he was looking for more time to have further consultations with the minority and the majority about the proposals in the budget, the budget statement. Now, that motion was to be uh, decided by Parliament whether he will be given that opportunity because on Friday, Parliament was winding up the debate of the budget. Now, in the, in the process, um, the Speaker called for a voice vote. And then Alexander Afenyo Markin, the erudite member of Parliament from Winneba, wanted what parliamentarians called a division. That means that a proper paper vote to be cast to determine who is on the left of the motion and who is on the right of the motion. So as the division was to be conducted, the speaker then decided that he needed to clear the aisle. In doing so, the speaker was of the view that the Honorable Ken Oforiata should walk out of the house, should leave the house. Well, that was a, 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 a naughty point, wasn't it? Because the speculation then is that if he is in the house, he will either infiltrate parliament by voting or he will either say something or something like that. that the, the speaker, it is alleged, was impugning wrongdoing motives to the Honorable Finance Minister, which he ought not to do. 
uh, if he was doing that. Alexander Fenyo Markin again rose to his feet and reminded the speaker that you cannot impute wrong motives uh, to the finance minister. He can remain here. There's precedent that ministers have remained here and votes have been taken. The speaker stood his ground and said that he had been acquainted with the standing orders for 26 odd years as a member of parliament and so insisted that Honorable Ken Ofoyata should leave the floor of the house. That's where the bad, bad blood began because the majority threw their support behind uh, their support, uh, their, their emotional support, I have to say, behind Ken Oforata in that singular uh, matter. Oforata walked out of the chamber of the House uh, quietly and obediently because the Speaker actually threatened to bring the Marshal, which is the policeman inside the, 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 the chamber of Parliament, to forcibly move them. So the Marshal's uh, work was not needed. Oforata left. As soon as Oforata left, the majority identified in the public gallery, the Honorable Johnson Asidun Katia, the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, be reminded at this part of the narrative that Asidun Katia is also a member of the Parliamentary Service Board. So uh, his supporter said that he was in Parliament in that capacity. Nonetheless, Asidun Katia was not on the chamber. There was not in the chamber. He was seated at the public gallery. It has to be said also that the majority did not actually give Speaker Bagbin the opportunity to rule whether or not Johnson Asidun Katia should leave the House or he should remain, uh, they just staged a walkout. Rumor and gossip has it that at that time, the majority were aware that they didn't have 138 members. And so if a question was put and there was a vote by division, it, it most likely would have ended at 137-137, in which case the rule says that the motion will be lost. So gossip had it that the majority wanted to buy time. And so they walked out hoping that they would put their numbers together. One more member was missing, and they were going to fetch that member so that they would have 138. As soon as they moved out, and they moved out being confident that moving out, the speaker will not be able to put the question. The business of parliament could go on because the, the constitution requires one third of the members of parliament, apart from the person presiding, to be present for the uh, quorum of parliament, for business of parliament to go on. However, the constitution wants at least half of the members of parliament to be present before a question could be put. Majority leader of Sergei Mensah Bonsu himself, sufficiently acquainted with the rules of parliament for about the same 26 years, was of the clear view that if the majority walked out on that occasion, parliament will not be able to continue by putting the question. Mr. Speaker, Alban Bagbin defied those uh, thoughts and uh, he proceeded to organize a headcount. The headcount came up with the result of 137 members in the chamber. Mr. Speaker continued to put the question regardless of the provisions in Article 104 of the 1992 Constitution or, shall I say, in complete uh, uh, flagrant violation of the Constitution. Speaker Bagbin actually did put the question. When the question was put, 137 people said no to Ofoyata's motion and there was no uh, vote for yes. Ofoyata's motion was then defeated. And then the Speaker proceeded to put the big question about the budget, for the approval of the budget. Still with 137 members, violates in flagrantry the uh, provisions of the 1992 Constitution. The question was put and 137 of the NDC members said that the budget should fail. So, as far as the Speaker was concerned, he announced that the budget had failed. Uh, in, the, in the records then we were recording a second budget that had failed. But that was Friday. The weekend had a lot of discussions, constitutional issues. Those of you who listen to radio, you heard all of that. Then comes Monday. Uh, the discussions continue. But Tuesday morning is the eventful day because that is the next sitting of Parliament. So the story begins at 8 o'clock this morning. The members of Parliament began arriving. And the press were anticipating that by 10 o'clock uh, in the forenoon, as they say, parliamentarians will come into the chamber. It was believed from the rumors that the majority MPP were going to uh, put up a motion to rescind what happened on Friday. I left something out. After Friday came Saturday. And then on Saturday by 5 p.m., Speaker Alban Bagbin had him planed on the Emirates plane on his way to Dubai to continue uh, his personal uh, matters. So Speaker Bagbin had left the jurisdiction on Saturday, the day after the Friday. That means a lot for the numbers in Parliament because it would mean that one of the deputy speakers, most likely the first deputy speaker, the Honorable Joe Oseusu, was to preside. Now, if Joe Osewusu was presiding, what does that do for the numbers of the new patriotic party? So that conversation was going on all over the weekend, and then Monday came, and then Tuesday came. So this morning, uh, the MPP's legal gurus had put together the plan 
The plan was that, okay, Joe Osewusu will preside, but the constitution counts the presiding person, uh, if he's deputy speaker, among the members of parliament. Now, they rely on two, the distinction between two constitutional articles. The first one, 102, which talks about a quorum, says that a quorum of parliament is one-third of the members of parliament apart from the person presiding. So the person presiding is not counted as part of the quorum. And then they go to 104, where, it is, uh, where the Constitution prescribes about putting the question, putting a question of um, any question to Parliament. And it says that before a question can be put in Parliament, before a matter can be determined in Parliament, now the Parliament must have one half of all the members. It does not exclude the person presiding. That is very clear. And therefore, they came to the conclusion that whoever presiding can be counted as part of the, uh, the members of Parliament uh, in the room. And that would mean one half of it. One half of the members of parliament will be 137 and a half. And so 137 is wrong. 138 is correct. If you can find human beings counted in halves, then 137 and a half is the accurate number. But we know that human beings are counted as a whole. And they are counted not behind, uh, but they are counted in front. So if it's half, then it becomes one. So 138 is the correct number that parliament must have based on their 275 uh, regulatory uh, um, uh, number, the regulatory number of 275 as a whole, they must have 137 and a half for uh, business of voting to be conducted. So, Joe Asayusu mounted the chair at 3.30, and he told Parliament that they and the minority had decided that the minority would participate in the business of the House. But at 3.30, the minority did not show up. They were not there. They, they didn't come. And we showed you a video of that already. They didn't come. And uh, um, so Joe Asayusu decided to conduct a head count. The head counts then revealed that they were 138, including himself, because they believed that clearly the Constitution allows the head counts for the purpose of voting to include the one sitting, if that person sitting is a member of parliament. So they distinguish between Article 102 and Article 104. 102 says quorum, apart from the person presiding. 104 says that to put a question, you must have half of all the members of the House present. So Mr. Osewusu counted himself, and they got 138. And then he put the question. Now, the question when it is put, the law under the Constitution, 104, says that you must first have half to put the question. When you put the question, you must have more than half of the people who vote. So you must have 138 to put the question. If you put the question, maybe 100 will vote. Of the 100 who vote, 51 must vote for it. That's really the technical meaning of it. So when you put the question, all 138 or all 275 ought not to vote. To put the question, they must be there. When you're counting the votes, you count half plus one of those who voted. So uh, he decided to do a voice vote after they found out that the NPP, the NDC were not there. So they voted on two matters. First of all, uh, to rescind the, uh, what happened on Friday, the, the yes had it, the eyes had it. And then he put another question by a voice vote about uh, the approval of the budget. And again, the eyes had it uh, in the absence, total absence of the minority. So as it is today, whilst people are heading to the Supreme Court to challenge Mr. Bagbin on what happened on uh, Friday, I don't know whether that matter may be moot because Parliament has rescinded it and cancelled it and expunged it from their record that it was wrong and it never should have happened. So I'm not sure whether it will be a moot question before the Supreme Court. Nonetheless, we know that people are heading to the Supreme Court for an interpretation. So Joe Osei also did the voice vote and the eyes had it. Okay, so the Parliament approved the budget. After that, the minority held a press conference. Tonight, we will show you the press conference and our Minister for Lands, who is also a lawyer, former Deputy Chief of Staff, Samuel Abdullah Jinapo, the member of Parliament for Damango constituency, will join us in the studio to tell us his experience since 8 o'clock this morning, what historical information has his research team gathered, and what portends for the Parliament going forward in terms of approving the estimates, and what is it about, is there rancor, is there bad blood between the minority and majority? So sit back and enjoy all of this. We'll take your questions, and tonight we'll let him take your questions as well, and uh, our social media will have plenty questions questions to ask. Before then, though, here is Haruna Idrisu addressing the press after the majority had passed the parliamentary, had passed the budget with a 138 present and with a voice vote. Here is Idrisu Haruna. When you lay a budget statement minus concessions and you approve it without knowing the concessions, what have you approved? What have you approved? So let's get serious. Those of you who are fami familiar with the work of Parliament, we have seen motions amended on the floor of Parliament. It was just for the Minister for Finance to amend those aspects of the budget statement, or for better choice of a word, revise it. 
For instance, on Acre Energy, we clearly drew their attention that your rendition does not reflect the resolution which were passed by Parliament. An unpleasant truth which he must accept today and accept tomorrow. He can alter that. So if you don't change it in the budget statement, where else are you going to change it? Which committee are you going to change it? We said EJAPA. We will not support EJAPA today. We will not support it tomorrow because this Minister of Finance have collateralized every opportunity and revenue in order that he can endanger the future for an incoming political administration led by John Dramani Mahama and the NDC. Ghana exam securitized, get fund collateralized, ESLA extended by nine years when the sunset was supposed to be for five years. Therefore, we simply said, don't collateralize our mineral resources. Because even without collateralization, you earn 130 million US dollars every other year. So, live with that. So, ladies and gentlemen of the press, we will address a full-scale press conference on all these issues. But we needed to let the Ghanaian people know where we stand. We don't support the e-levy in this form and character as announced in paragraph 315 and 316 of the budget statement. Our indication to them to revise it to take care of the ordinary people, particularly people who depend on $100 remittances from abroad, even when the ranking member of finance school them, that not all the remittances go to household. Some of it is for purposes of business, capital. As the Honorable Adongo observed, you don't tax capital. So concessions, I want anybody to show to me where they, they have approved a budget subject to unknown concessions. The concessions are known only to Minister of Finance and to the Honorable Osei Mensa Bosu. Is that how the Parliament of Ghana should work? Is that how Parliament should approve a budget policy and economic policy statement of government? What does that mean for your absence? You are 137. If you were present, what that meant was that when the question was put, we would have had no 137 to counter the yes 137. Uh, we don't intend to respond to that. What we do know is that they say we should respect constitution and that we're 137. We're also aware that they are 137, but they are jubilating that they have approved the budget, yet we couldn't reject the budget with the same number. We leave that to your thoughts. We'll take two more. Thank, thank you very much. Someone was asking that if we were in the chamber, we could have been 137, 137, the vote would have been lost. I believe someone put a video of me with Professor Quay, where it is the speaker, you must cut the speaker's eye. And we are very informed what they were trying to do. What they were trying to do was that if we were in the chamber, after the question, he would go blind and he would not see. But our presence will have given them a vote, of, a vote and proceedings of tomorrow of 275 to legitimize, just as we are insisting that we were 274. So our absence will give them a vote of proceedings tomorrow of 138 minus a speaker, that is 137. The standard order says, and I'll quote, in order seven, speaker or Mr. Speaker includes member presiding at a sitting. So if you are sitting, you become, if you are in the chair, if you are presiding, you become Mr. Speaker. You cannot, for purposes of decision, be counted as part of those who were there to take the decision. And if we were in the chamber and he went blind to call us to be able to call for head count, they will have, we will have helped them legitimize what the action they were doing. And that was why, strategically, we had to be absent so that the vote on proceedings will show. Because the two records will become the records of this country yes. thousands of years to come. Both of the Hansard and then the vote on proceedings. And it will be clearly shown on Friday were 274 as against on tuesday 138 when one was presiding as speaker so that's the major reason why we we we, we chose to be absent because it was clear All right. during the discussions that that was what they wanted to do we'll have to we'll to down. 
Welcome back to the show, and the minister has taken his position. Okay, let's go to our social media people. Let me begin with you, uh, Matilda. What do you have? Okay, from Inokojo, we should not kid ourselves, Paul, as both parties are trying to play us. This whole thing was planned from Friday for the minority to reject the budget. Speaker miraculously travels. Deputy Speaker steps in and resigns and approves the budget. If they were not playing us, then all the NDC MPs could have been present today, which would have tied both parties to 137 each, and the budget would still have been rejected. And also from Stephen Spionyako Brakwa, who puts the question, the Speaker, and he countered himself, explains. Sizeless Nana Kwesi says, whether they like it or not, the budget has been approved. They just wanted to hinder the development of this country as they always have. And then Saka Badilara Awao says, I will sleep well tonight. Powerful good evening coming on with the powerful learned lawyer Abu Jinako. Tijani Salawatia says, we are expecting nothing but the best analysis of what transpired on Friday and today as well. For my mentor at FA, Mr. Poadomotri, may God richly bless you and your teams. I love Good Evening Ghana. Lucina Mohammed says, Honorable Lawyer Samo Jinapo is indeed a gentle jack. Master, let the language flow. Man of action, we dare your back. All right, also from Alaji Bob City. Good evening, Paul. Thank God it's Tuesday. I'm seated comfortably watching you and your hardworking crew. Paul, today is one of my happiest days because the Ajinkwa budget has been approved despite the hypocrisy and the ignorance by the minority and their number three man. Greetings from Old Tafu, Kumasi Zamfara Base, and then also from NX Clinton. I will choose Good Evening Ghana over any other political show to which Robert Force Kweja Baje responded, it's the only educative political talk show in the country. The haters can say otherwise. Bashina Amuab Samo Paul says, point of correction, Bad Evening Ghana, where did we go wrong for being Ghanaians? Poncho, Poncho says, Ekufado's government is rewriting history power. So many unprecedented acts adding to the history of the Fourth Republic, many of which are illegalities. Seriously, and Rock Balfour says, double track system was introduced to some of our SHS. Now it's being introduced in, in the Parliament House. Okay. So yeah, last one. For you, from Samuel Fusuba says, for Aduma Tree, you are a gem in the Ghanaian journalism. The other TV stations are imitating your analysis TV presentations. And also yesterday, your yesterday's analytical budget proposal came through. My warmest greetings to your young disciples. Oh, that's you are one of them, aren't you? <laughs> okay, Honorable Minister, you've had a long day. Yes, sir. Uh, this is your first time in Parliament and uh, your first time as a Cabinet Minister coming from a very busy schedule as Deputy Chief of Staff. Will today feature in your diary as one of the, the days to look out for? Is it going to start red in your diary, blue, yellow, white? Well, it's obviously a momentous day. There's no two ways about that. And I think the observation you've made for me is very apt, which is that this is true Ghanaian democracy at work. And I think the Ghanaian people and all of us, particularly the political actors, you see it in that light, mm -hmm. which is that the uh, instruments of democracy have been tested and have been contended upon, and so on and so forth. And on the floor of parliament, the uh, contentions have been heated. That is what democracy ought to be. As you know, in the House of Commons, Brexit, the you know hard Brexit, soft Brexit, uh, all of the issues that came up under Prime Minister Theresa May through even to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and the debates which took place, rejection, not rejected, and so on. So it all goes to enrich the democracy of our country. I mean, the bit of it that I'm personally not particularly comfortable with is when matters degenerate into uh, rowdiness and the house becomes a bit ungovernable. I understand that in any democracy, parliament, sometimes even Asian parliament, they throw chairs at each other and so on and so forth. So a bit of, as we say in Ghana, a bit of tobe tobe is, is allowed. Mm -hmm. But when it gets out of hand, it becomes a problem. So if you ask me what is this day, the day is a momentous one, it's a historic one. Uh, very landmark decisions have been taken by the parliament of Ghana today. We took very important decisions, and that is how I see it. 
what happened on Friday? Let's start from Friday then as we begin the narration. What happened on Friday? On Friday, um, we began the sitting with processes leading to the approval or otherwise of the economic policy and statement of the government. It uh, moved on to the minority leader rounding up the submission or the position of the minority. And as you know before, the majority leader has requested that the Minister for Finance be given an opportunity to wind up the debate and, 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 and make a prayer which the speaker took the view that the minority's position be stated first. And therefore, the Honorable Harun Idrisu had opportunity to conclude and state the minority's position. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, the majority leader concluded the debate of the majority. And then the prayer came in. When the prayer... What does that mean, prayer? We are confusing well, us. Prayer, prayer is church. an application. I mean, mm -hmm. okay. uh, making a request mm -hmm. in, in layman's language. Mm -hmm. Making a request to the House for the Minister of Finance to be given an opportunity to engage with the leadership of the House in view of the controversy which had arisen. His view was that his five previous parliaments had passed with consensus. Mm -hmm. And he would desire that this sixth one will also pass with consensus, a bipartisan consensus. And to the extent that that bipartisan consensus seemed not to be working out, he will, he will pray to the House to give him an opportunity to continue with further engagement. That application was opposed by the minority. It was put to a vote, a voice vote, and the speaker said, the speaker determined that the nay had it. The deputy majority leader, Honorable Afenio Markin, rose on his feet and challenged the determination of the speaker and requested for a division. Okay, hold on. Let's understand this. So, finance minister says, I would prefer that this goes by consensus, as my previous budgets did. Mr. Speaker, can you give me more time, which would have meant an adjournment of the process? Yes. Can you give me more time to engage with both the majority and minority to further explain to them what I want to do, let's draw jaw and achieve consensus before we come? And this was opposed by minority. They don't want further consultation. Exactly. Is that what it will mean? But that's what it meant. They didn't want further consultation. That is exactly what it meant. They wanted even, to vote now. Yes, even the speaker made a point that the consultations ought to have been done long ago. But as a matter of fact, the finance minister thought otherwise. That, look, given that the minority have, ta have tabled some demands and uh, insisting on some mm -hmm. concessions from the government, he felt that it will be important to give an opportunity for an engagement with the leadership of parliament, hopefully uh, with a view of coming to some understanding so he can get this bipartisan consensual support for the budget. That was turned down. So a division was taken, and then in the course of the division, the speaker asked that all ministers walk out, and the finance minister should walk out, and that if he did not walk out, uh, he will unleash the marshals on him to throw him out of parliament. Uh, it was at that point that the member of parliament from Price, my very good friend, uh, courageous chap, very uh, uh, forthright, outspoken, bold, uh, you know, frontal man, stood up and said the general secretary of the NDC was also in the chamber and therefore in the uh, public uh, the, uh, gallery. gallery. So, he also should uh, exit. It degenerated into some uh, level of chaos, if you want. And then the majority walked out, and the speaker uh, went ahead and determined the division of 137 to 0, and further proceeded to put a vote in respect of the motion for the approval of the budget of the government, which voice vote, obviously, was in a, and then he uh, declared the budget rejected. So that's exactly what happened on Friday. Mm. In, in some why have we heard that that is illegal? Well, Paul, if that, that that is seriously, if I may, I mean, I think at this stage it's important for me to point out that in a democracy, consensus is important. Uh, negotiations, carrying 
people along is so important. And I think that we have not lost that opportunity yet. Today, the majority and the minority leadership were locked in uh, almost a three, four hour period of negotiation. Unfortunately, it didn't yield the results that we all desired. So we st I still believe that there's a good lot of opportunity out there for us to continue to engage. There's no two ways about that. And in the nature of this parliament, and, and in all parliament, it should be the case, uh, the, the need for uh, engagement and consensus is, is absolutely imperative. But even before I go there, let me point out that, I, I mean, I heard, your, I heard your commentary. What took place today was not a recession. Mm -hmm. No, it was not a recession. Today, it was an application or a motion moved person to order 50 of the standing orders of parliament. And, and, and if you will permit me, I'll read order 50, and I quote. Order 51 says, at the time appointed for the purpose under order 53, order of business, any member may, with the prior approval of Mr. Speaker, move a motion on a specific matter of urgent public importance, end quote. This is the order that the majority leader stood on mm -hmm. to make the prayer that the decision of Friday, the decision of Friday the 26th, I, I presume, mm -hmm. the decision of Friday the 26th was in contravention with Article 1041 of the National Constitution and therefore ought to be declared a nullity. And Paul, as you know, I mean, just as I do, voidable orders mm -hmm. and orders which are vitiated are totally different. I mean, a void order is simply means it never even took place. It never even existed. And in the course of our discussion, I'll demonstrate to you decisions of the House of Commons and several other uh, parliament where it had been determined that the decision never even took place because the decisions were void ab initio. In other words, they were nullity. And so the Majority leader did not ask for a recession. He asked for a, a declaration that the decision taken on 26 November 2021 on Friday was null and void. It was void ab initio. So that it never happened. It never happened. Expunged from the records Expunged of parliament. Expunged from the records of parliament. I mean, that's what he did, mm -hmm. which was approved. Now, what is the quarrel? Is your question. And I've already uh, prefaced my, tried to preface my submission by saying that the need for consensus and for uh, jaw join and rest is, is important. Moving forward, there's no two ways about that. We need each other to be able to keep the state of shape flowing, uh, floating and, and working and so on and so forth. But the question about what took place on Friday, Paul, my view is that it is either legally tenable or it is not tenable. Mm -hmm. and I think I will appeal to my colleagues from the other side and to all of us pundits and commentators to try and, and engage in this discussion in a very dispassionate manner, in a manner which serves the democracy of our country. So if what happened was lawful, it is lawful. Mm -hmm. If it is unlawful, it is unlawful. You mean there's no gray area? There should be no gray area. It's either black or white. It's either black and white. And, and how the, do we determine and, that? And the precedent mm -hmm. that we set today will leave to hunt the ninth parliament, the tenth parliament, the eleventh parliament. So we cannot be engaged in subjective argument. First of all, I know a lot of people have, uh, Article 104 has been overwhipped, but for purposes of your viewers who may not have had the benefit of that article, permit me to just quote that article to begin um, my submission. That article says, Article 1041, except as otherwise provided in this constitution, matters in parliament shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting. I want to repeat that. Determined by the votes of the majority of members present and voting. So first of all, the majority of members must be present and voting. With at least half of all the members of parliament present. So the very lay, simple uh, interpretation of this provision of the constitution, which is really not complex, I mean, it's mm -hmm. black and white, means that, first of all, you must have half of the members of parliament present. Half. Half. So if you have 200, 100. 100. You have 150. 275, 138. You must mm -hmm. have half of the members of parliament 
president, he says, with at least half of all, all the members of parliament present. And then he says, determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting. So, assuming you have a parliament of 200 members, you need half of the members of all the members of parliament present. That is 101. Okay? And then it says you need more than half of the members present and vote. So, half of that. That's really what it is. So, I'm not too sure that there is any debate about this. And, and, and Paul, this question, there's precedent. There's precedent. And I'll demonstrate it to you. I have here in my hand the hands out of Tuesday, 22nd December 2015. 15, okay. Yes. Tuesday, 22nd December 2015 mm -hmm. of the parliament mm -hmm. of our country. I, I think it was the state parliament. In the state parliament, Paul, mm -hmm. A matter which is on all fours with this matter came up before the floor of the house. Mm -hmm. And the speaker then, who was then the majority leader, Honorable Albin Babin, uh, our speaker today, spoke to the matter of quorum. And I quote him. Quote. And you see it. This is the hands that I can show it. Okay. It's par uh, do the quote. Parliamentary debates. Mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. The same matter came up. The first deputy speaker, Honorable Bartino Drew, was in the chair. And the question about the quorum required to take decisions came up. And the speaker, who was the majority leader, made a submission, contributed to the debate. And he said, and I quote, In the case of headcount, Mr. Speaker shall take the vote of the House by calling upon members who support or oppose his decision successively to rise on their places. A member may vote in a division even if he did not hear the question put. Mr. Speaker, it is important for this to be ironed out clearly. Mr. Speaker, after you have taken the count, it is incumbent on Mr. Speaker to announce the results. After that, others can follow but it's unprecedented to defer the results. Mr. Speaker, the results will have to be announced for us to know. Then interruptions. Because this is because I believe that we satisfy the constitutional provision as provided in Article 104. And I will want to read that out. Article 1041 says, and Honorable Babin quotes it, except as otherwise provided in this constitution, Matters in Parliament shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting, with at least half of all the members of Parliament present, end quote. And then Honorable Babin, the right Honorable Babin today, continues, hands out of the Parliament. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, we are 275 members. Half of that is 138, end quote. And it goes on. Mr. Speaker, I believe that we are more than 138. And it goes on and on and on. Mm. So in the hands out of Tuesday, 22nd December 2015, the speaker of today, who was majority leader at the time, who contributed to a debate which related on all fours, four square, with on all forces legal language so you mean it's exactly exactly as, as mm -hmm. is happening today mm -hmm. exactly and where article 104 needed an needed. interpretation the speaker spoke eloquently and eruditely to affirm that you need to satisfy the requirements of article 1041 before a decision can be taken and indeed he even gives the figure which you require to qualify Article 1041. And he says, Mr. Speaker, we are 275 members. Half of that is 138. Paul, the matter was litigated further. And the Speaker at the time gave a ruling. And the matter of what? This matter. Of whether of, of the, of the, of the numbers yes, that, of the numbers, that what was required for the, the issues of the numbers or the interpretation of 104. Yes, mm. and the, the speaker at the time made a determination on the same day, 22nd December 2015. The 
First Deputy Speaker, Honorable Ebo Batinodro, mm -hmm. had ruled that there were 133 people in the chamber, and it was all captured in the hands up. Okay. 133 people, members in the chamber, and therefore, they did not have the numbers to take a decision. Mm -hmm. And that was challenge. And the speaker, the speaker, on, on the same day, came and gave a ruling Ebo Batinodro was leading the, the conversation. The debate. But the, the he main was speaker, Joe Ajao, was absent. Mounted the chair to give a ruling. Yes, and then. On the same day. On the same day. Listen, later that day, mm -hmm. the speaker, and I'm reading from the hands up, mm -hmm. Right Honorable Edward Kobe Do Ajao again ruled on the matter as follows, and I quote, mm -hmm. and I'm reading verbatim from the hands up. Honorable members, you are aware that this house. Is not supreme. We are subject to the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. The rule is that where the Constitution has made a provision for regulation of the business of the House, they take precedence over any other rule. Indeed, the standing orders of this House, there is quorum to do business, and that is one third of the House, and there is quorum to take a decision. So, we need to draw a distinction between the quorum to do business and the quorum to take a decision. The quorum to take a decision is regulated by Article 1041. The fundamental question is that the time that the vote was taken, did we have at least half of the honorable members present? It is a constitutional issue which has been captured in the Standing Order 1091 of the Standing Orders. If we go by the results of the headcount, by adding 67 to 66, we will get 133. Therefore, there is a serious constitutional issue there. So at the time that the votes were taken, this House lacked the legal, in fact, the constitutional capacity to take a decision. So I entirely endorse the position taken by the Honorable First Deputy Speaker, that we do not have the number, constitutionally speaking, to take a decision. Therefore, no decision has been taken. Wow. End quote. That's very strong. Yeah. So, That's very I'm strong. not sure why we are... This is Dua Jao speaking. Yes. Very, very strong. Yeah. So, so and, and Paul, look, hold on. Let me refer you to... Let me refer you to one of the foremost authorities mm -hmm. when it comes to parliamentary practice and mm -hmm. is uh, here, uh, how our parliaments function, an introduction to the law, practice and procedure of the Parliament of Ghana, K.B. Ayensu and S.N. Dakwa. Mm -hmm. You are very familiar with mm -hmm. these uh, yeah. famous jurists and authorities on parliamentary practice and procedure. And, and listen, they, they make a commentary on Article 1041. Mm -hmm. and, and they go on, and, and I quote, a business which is not an adjournment a business which is not an adjournment may not be transacted in the house if a member brings to the notice of the chair the fact that there are less than one third of the members present, excluding the member presiding. Mm -hmm. After proceedings have begun, the chair cannot personally take objection that there is no quorum. A quorum of one third of all the members present is required to commence business in the house. A quorum of one half of the members present is required to approve loan agreement or decide on motions before the house with regard to constitutional approval amendments it will require two-thirds of all the members to approve the proposed amendment but paul this is where it, this is the mm. most significant part i'm about to read this part he says until the, se the sec until the second republic decisions on a matter before the house could be taken by one third of the members present. It was felt that as decisions and acts of parliament affect all citizens, at least one half of all the members present should take those decisions. End quote. So before 1969, you required one third. And they explained why the constitution now stipulates that you need more than half because it affects all the citizens of the country. So, so, so the, the, the matter of. Um, um, quorum to take a decision. I it's, think that's quite it's, clear. It's settled. But, but just let me let mm -hmm. me conclude on, on just but one, one last But what Ghanaians are asking authority. though is that 
if the NDC were not in parliament today, address us on how this matter was satisfied. Yeah, so we'll do it. But, but okay. just before mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. just finally, I have in my hand the hands out of 30th March 1984 of the House of Commons, mm -hmm. where a similar matter, the matter of all parliaments, mm -hmm. a similar matter arose before them. Mm -hmm. And it was settled in the same manner that ours have been settled. And yes. I quote, mm -hmm. it appearing on the report of the division that 40 members were not present, Mr. Deputy Speaker declared that the question was not decided and the business under consideration stood over until the next sitting of the house and courts so they did not have a quorum mm -hmm. to take a decision mm -hmm. so the quorum to take a decision goes to the heart goes to the it's a fundamental so we identified two quorums one in article 102 and one in article 104 quorum simplicity in 102 for sitting, and 104 for, for, decision both, for, for decision making so this is it so, so and the, the thresholds are different the threshold, one third and majority so clearly i mm -hmm. mean what took place on friday I, I don't know i mean i have a lot of respect for the speaker i think he's an experienced parliamentarian um he, he's a colossus of a parliamentarian there's no two ways about that clearly the speaker either either they didn't in the heat of things they didn't avert his mind to it or i don't know what happened but this is so trite so this is not but, but he haven't having done fact, the minority a, leader such an erudite work on it in 2015 it's surprising that he would it would have escaped well, him. The same, the same I, I, mind that, that evidently educated the public and the parliament on it in 2015. Yeah, yeah he did. And the hands he is, yeah, he spoke to mm. it. He said he didn't want it to eat. Mm. But I decision. really like Doha Jao's ruling. I'd like to keep that. Yeah, yeah I'll, give, I'll give you a copy. <laughs> it's, it's very, very yeah, yeah, yeah. This Okay, is, so that, that said, uh, I was going to ask you about, well, there must have been some maneuverings at the weekend. Maybe you can't tell us all of that. Uh, which one can you share with us? What were, what were all of the, you No doing? maneuvering. It's just, it's just sticking to the law. Fidelity to the law. There's, there's no, and the procedures and, and all of that. There's okay, no so then today, at 3 o'clock, when you guys walked into Parliament, how did you discharge the obligations imposed by Article 104? Okay. So, Paul, mm -hmm. um, it, may, it may sound a bit legalized, but mm -hmm. let's put it out. Yeah. Article 102. Mm -hmm. When you go to 102, When you go to 102, the subtitle itself is instructive. Okay. The subtitle says, Quorum in Parliament. That's how it's subtitled. Okay. And Article 102 says, A quorum of Parliament, apart from the person presiding, shall be one third of all the members of Parliament. Mm -hmm. That's a quorum to conduct business. Mm -hmm. So if you want to conduct business, you recall, even last week, Parliament was suspended or adjourned because Parliament didn't have quorum. Mm -hmm. You need one third of all the members of Parliament present. I don't know what number that will be, mm -hmm. but then the calculate for me one third of two hundred and seventy-five. Then, then be. the person presiding, mm -hmm. the person presiding is not counted. That is for purposes of quorum. It's like if you have a board, mm -hmm. it, the board, the regulations of the company may say that you need a third of the members of the board to begin a meeting. But when it comes to a decision, the regulation may give a different threshold. Mm -hmm. Then when you come to Article 1041, there it is titled Voting in Parliament, mm -hmm. where it says, except as otherwise provided in this constitution, matters in Parliament shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present in voting with at least half of all the members of parliament present. Paul, there is, there, is a, there is a fundamental difference between Article 102 and 104. In 102, the framers of the Constitution deliberately exclude the person presiding. Presiding, yeah. In, in, the, in getting to the count. Yes. Uh, yeah, in achieving, in achieving how, how many quorum. numbers yes. that we have, yeah. In 104, mm -hmm. the framers of the Constitution do not exclude the, the person presiding. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul, you know that, I mean, this is trite learning, trite law, and uh, the expression is expresso unus es exclusio authoris. Mm -hmm. that, that's the rule of the, interpretation. Yes, and, and the literal meaning express mention of a thing implies the exclusion of all others. Of all others. In yeah. the same document, the same framers of the Constitution, 
in 102, they mention the person presiding. You are excluded. From determining whether we have a quorum, then, or, then, quorum or not. Then two or another... Uh, two, two articles uh, further. Further, 104, they don't. It simply means... They intended. They intended not to, not to exclude the person. So mm. I'm not sure that the lawyers, I mean, from the other, Dr. Aine and the rest, they'll contest this. I mean, he taught me law in law faculty. Mm. He cannot look in my face and tell me that, Jinapo, this, this principle of law you are expounding or initiated is wrong. It's a basic fundamental principle of law. First year faculty of law, you are taught this rule, this canon of interpretation. In a document, whether a contract or whatever. Let's explain it again to viewers to understand that where it says the person presiding must be excluded in counting members of parliament. And in another provision, and in two it provisions doesn't say later, so. it says count members of parliament as half. It doesn't say exclude the person presiding. Yes. It means that if the person presiding is qualified to be counted, you count him. And I'm saying and qualified to parliament. be counted because Mr. Speaker Bambagme will not be qualified to be counted. At all, because he's not a member of parliament. Yes. So because the constitution knows that the speaker is not a member of parliament. Yes. And the constitution knows that a deputy speaker is a member of parliament. Absolutely. So when it says that the person presiding, which could be either speaker or deputy, it, it doesn't exclude him. It means where it is a member of parliament, he's counted. Yes. Okay. So, so, so when you are coming to do quorum, mm -hmm. which is, which is, um, quorum, which is one third. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that one third is 91.6, which will mean 92. Good. So, mm -hmm. so, so when you are doing quorum for purposes of conducting business, the fair, the speaker is excluded when mm -hmm. he's presiding. Mm -hmm. This First deputy speaker, when he's presiding, is excluded. It's excluded, yes. The second deputy speaker, when he's presiding, is excluded. It's it doesn't say the speaker, it says the person presiding. The person presiding. Okay. Because it, it cannot say the speaker simpliciter. Because there is a speaker, there is a first deputy speaker, there's a second deputy speaker. The, uh, the animal, the legal animal speaker, first deputy speaker, and second deputy speaker are totally different and distinct mm. because... The, fair, the speaker is not a member of parliament. Cannot be a member of parliament. Cannot be a member Even of parliament. Even if he is, he has to leave the he seat. He has to leave the seat. But the first and second speaker are members of parliament and have a right to represent their constituents in the house. So even that, when they are chairing? Yes, even when they are chairing. Mm -hmm. For purposes of voting. Mm -hmm. Which is why, which is why, it, if I, the, my view is that the jurisprudential underpinning for Article 104 is the recognition of the right of the people of Bekwai and Fomena for their members of parliament to be able to express their views through voting in the house, which is why they are excluded in Article 1041. So when it comes to quorum for taking decisions, when the second or first deputy speaker is presiding, they are not excluded mm -hmm. for purpose of quorum. They are counted. Yeah. They are counted, which is why today the members of parliament present in the house for decision taking where 138 including the person presiding yes because because he is excluded for purpose of presiding for quorum for conducting business under article 102 but article 104 he is excluded and i've just so given you i've given you the principle of law on that which mm -hmm. is the the express yeah, so the counts the count today was and, 138 and, and the authorities to that effect supreme court authorities kwajoga adra versus national democratic Congress. I have a list of authorities. Mm -hmm. In fact, orders 41 of the standing orders of the House of Commons affirms that. Order 29 of the standing orders of the House of Commons of Canada affirms that. It is established law. That you need half. Half. And that the, 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 pers and that the person presiding as opposed to okay, the uh, quorum, the quorum okay. for doing business and the quorum for taking decisions. Okay, so what so, was so the count today when the NDC at 330 did not show up in the house. What was the count? 138. Including the person presiding. Yes, 138. That is all the members on the MPP side. Yes, plus the, the, the independent member from Formina. Correct. 138. And there's one other explanation I, I need to put out because I've monitored on Facebook a few uh, issues that have been raised. The number you need, the quorum you need to take a decision is more than half of members of parliament. Mm -hmm. Okay? Half. More than, not half. Yes, half of is members it more of than. It's at least half. No, at least half of at the members of parliament. Yes. Yeah. Half of the members of parliament. But the decision, yes. you require half of the members present and voting. Mm -hmm. So if it's a parliament of 200, you, half is 100. Mm -hmm. And that half, which is 100, you need, <coughs> you need 51. 
to carry the decision. To carry the decision. In case you do a division. But yes, today, you guys didn't do a division. You, you don't need don't a, need a voice division vote. when the, the name is clear. I mean, it's, if it's somebody challenges the voice mm -hmm. determination that you go through a division. And, and the, the simple thing is that when the voice vote is carried, ordinarily the speaker is supposed to determine that this voice is, has the highest number mm -hmm. of people. But if somebody challenges it, then you do the head count to determine that indeed and in fact the okay. voice vote is authentic or not. In other words, the number of people who said yay are more than those who said nay. So we are satisfied so, so that it's, the it's speaker can count himself. But assuming the NDC were there, could the speaker have voted? Did the speaker, the one in the chair, did he participate in the vote today? He didn't, because he didn't have to. If he, he needed didn't... to, was he qualified well, to on. vote? You did, he didn't have to because mm -hmm. you had 138. You needed half of 138. So why should he vote? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the response of, to the voice vote was all the 137. So the motion was carried without Also, oh, that even if there was a division, you're looking for half of 138. Yes, that's, yes, that's, yes. that's your contention. Oh, yes, yes. It's there. 104. Read mm -hmm. 104. Mm -hmm. Can I read it for you again? 104. Okay. Let's read it so, again. So there was no point. Let's read it again. So okay. Except as otherwise provided in this constitution, mm -hmm. matters in parliament shall be determined by the votes of the majority of members present mm -hmm. and voting. Yeah. Not all members of parliament, by the majority of members present and voting. Mm -hmm. Then it adds a caveat, which mm -hmm. is with at least half of all the members of parliament present. So mm -hmm. it is not half of all members of parliament yeah. who take a decision. Is half of the mem majority of the members of parliament present and voting. But the members of parliament who, who ought to be present in order to legitimize the vote must be half of the members of parliament. Let me give you a breather. Let's go and hear what uh, people who are listening to you are saying. Let's start with you, uh, Matilda. What do you have? from Joshua Boateng. This, this guy is a learned colleague indeed. Kudos to you, Honorable. Okay. Um, Gastin Man says, in all these, what is the finance minister going to do about the E-Levy? It's important to ignore the NDC and concentrate on, that, on the effect of that mm -hmm. levy. And Gastin Cohn says, Paul, in as much as I respect Honorable um, Abu Jinapo, coming onto the show explaining the constitution standing orders. Can you please bring a neutral professor to do so? At least there won't be any bias. And Edward Dubaza says, Paul, on Friday, 274 MPs were in parliament. Why was it illegal if it was Afenio Markin who requested the voting by division? I disagree with Samuel Jinapo. No, he didn't quite say that. Read that message again. Let, let's get him to respond. What, what is it? He said on Friday. On Friday, 274 MPs were in Parliament. Why was it illegal if Afenio Markins was the one who requested for voting by division? Can you educate us on that? Well, the, okay, so that's a good question. The, the request for division was in respect of the motion or the application lodged by the finance minister mm -hmm. for an adjournment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we shouldn't confuse the two. Yeah. The finance minister requested that the House be adjourned for him to engage in further consultation. It is that request or that application or that motion which was subjected to a decision mm -hmm. and to which the speaker put the question and the speaker determined that they may have it. In other words, the application is being refused. It is pursuant to that that the deputy majority that called for a division. So the division was in respect of the application of the finance minister, not in respect of the motion to approve the economic policy of the government. No. Okay, there's another argument that at the time proceedings began in parliament, there were 275 or 274. That's the record. So if some people decide to walk out, they have still committed themselves to being part of the process. And therefore, the question about 138 was sufficiently answered before the walkout. Does the walkout truncate the process? Does it break the chain of causation towards the eventual voting, either for the Foyata motion or for the budget? So that you can explain for people to understand. People are saying that, ah, but you started the meeting, all of you were there. And it was recorded that you have 275 members. At some point, people walk out. So, so it doesn't matter. They can go all they want, but they've been recorded. So if we're looking for the numbers of people, they will go to the record. We have 275. is more than 138. The others who think that 
when somebody registers a workout that I don't want to be part of this anymore, it means that you cannot count him as part of that from the beginning. What is, what is the interpretation? Well, but it's a very straightforward interpretation. The, the question, the question uh, we have to answer is what does it mean to say of all, half of all the members of parliament present? So present. What does present constitute? That you are there. So, you're there. Absent so, is, is absent. Yeah. Present is present. So if you go and write your so name. So if you were present and you became absent, you are absent. If you go and write your name and you even go for a committee meeting, you are not present. Mm -hmm. You are not present. Mm -hmm. You are not present at the time the question is put. Yeah. The, the emphasis is at the time the question That is why is when there's a contention, a head count must take place of the people who are there now. Exactly. Not those who are in the office in the chamber. Exactly. Not those who are in the lobby. And that is why the speaker in... Two, in, in, in the speaker in 2015, when he was majority leader, talked about head count. You heard him. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. said, having conducted a head count, these are the implications. These are the consequential steps. Mm -hmm. So there is really no ambiguity as to what constitutes present. I, there's no ambiguity. In fact, there have been situations where people have come to parliament and gone for committee meetings without coming into the chamber, and they've been marked absent. Because present for purposes of parliamentary procedure is to be present in the chamber. Okay, let's take another break and uh, see Afenyo Markin speaking in parliament earlier today. Uh, our first video is, is eight minutes long. Maybe we'll cut it short a bit. He also brought up some issues about whether or not a deputy speaker can rule on something that a substantive speaker had done. Here is Afenyo Markin speaking in parliament today. Speaker, I humbly rise to second the motion ably moved by the majority leader and the leader of the House. Mr. Speaker, in seconding the motion, I beg to raise the following issues to further fortify the prayer of the applicant. Mr. Speaker, first whether or not you have the capacity to determine this matter. The Speaker, on that score, the Speaker, I shall rely on order 13.2 of the rules of this House to say that you are so well fortified to consider this matter. Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, I shall read order 13.2 which provides, whenever the House is informed by the clerk at table of the unavoidable absence of Mr. Speaker, the first Deputy Speaker shall perform the duties and exercise the authority of Mr. Speaker in relation to all proceedings of the House until Mr. Speaker resumes the chair without any further communication to the House. Mr. Speaker, rightly so. The clerk at table has informed us that Mr. Speaker is unavoidably absent and that by that imperative you are well fortified to assume the full duties, mandate, power, responsibilities as though you are the Speaker of the House. So Mr. Speaker, you are fortified to consider this application. Mr. Speaker, second, it is trite, it is trite that the constitutional provision relied on by the applicant clearly gives us the number required to be present in this chamber for the purposes of taking decision in Parliament. And Mr. Speaker, one half of Parliament will be 138. For the avoidance of doubt, the record 
in our votes clearly states that Mr. Speaker in the chair had indicated that there were a number 137 zero saying yes. Meaning, Mr. Speaker, that at that moment in time, we did not have 138 present. Which, which, Mr. Speaker, Article 104 one. It's also very clear that when that minimum number is present, the decision must be based on the majority of those present to take a decision. And Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, I shall read that aloud. Except as otherwise provided in this constitution, matters in parliament shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting with at least half of all the members of parliament present. So Mr. Speaker, the net effect is that one, the threshold of 138 must be met and that in that 138, majority of them would now be required to take a decision. Mr. Speaker, having made these contentions, I beg to say, now, Mr. Speaker, this constitutional imperative clearly vitiates that which took place. And now, Mr. Speaker, on all fours, the applicant motion is well rooted. And, Mr. Speaker, the invitation made to you on all fours is right. And I therefore, Mr. Speaker, without any hesitation, implore you, Mr. Speaker, to give favorable consideration to this application. Mr. Speaker, I shall submit, and I thank you. Very regrettable that there's nobody on the minority bench. Indeed, we've been engaging a leadership of the House, expanded leadership, from 9 a.m. We closed at 2.30 to give ourselves one hour to have lunch and to resume at 3.30. Uh, I have no information why nobody on the other side is here, but we clearly agreed that Parliament will sit at 3.30. It was a meeting at which the leadership on the minority was present, and we had had discussions from morning up to this time. So it's a pity there's nobody here so I could hear their views on the motion before me. But. As has been pointed out um, um, under order 1091, let me read for emphasis. No question for a decision in the House shall be proposed for determination unless they are present in the House, not less than one half of all members of the House. And except otherwise provided in the Constitution, the question proposed shall be determined by a majority of votes members present and voting. So before I take any decision, I want to confirm that I have a majority of members of parliament in the chamber. <laughs> May the clerks at table assist me by how we're going to do it, call out names or members, you go around and count the members. Honourable members, the number presented to me by the clerk's at table is 137 of you plus me, MP for the Kwai, 138. Honourable <laughs> members, the motion that was moved by the Honourable Minister and have been debated is now ready for a decision to be taken. We have already determined that the appropriate numbers are in the chamber, and therefore the House stands ready to take a decision. Now I'll put the question. All in favor of the House adopting the resolution moved by the Honorable Minister for Finance, say aye. aye. All against, say no.
the eyes of it. The House has accordingly approved a budget statement of for the ensuing year ending 20, 31st December 2020. Honorable Minister, so we had the, the Deputy Speaker say 137 plus me, counting himself. The contention here is that if whilst a speaker is presiding, whilst presiding, the Constitution says that he cannot have an, or retain his original vote or have a casting vote, how then is he able to count himself as part of the people for the purpose of the voting, given that the count is a conditioned precedent for the vote to occur? He can participate in the condition precedent, but he cannot participate in the vote. Or can he participate in the vote? Well, let us um, uh, unpack the issues. First of all, you, you, we are talking about quorum for mm -hmm. uh, conducting business. We are talking about forum, quorum for taking decision. Mm -hmm. And you are now bringing a, a third uh, issue of whether or not the speaker, when he's presiding, can vote. And can be counted. And can be counted. Can be counted and can vote. There's yes. a contention that he cannot be counted. Those who are making that contention say that if he cannot vote, how can he be counted? Well, I haven't said he cannot vote. I haven't said that. The, whether or not the speaker can be counted is to be determined by on the strength of Article 102 and 104. And I'm, con I'm submitting that there is absolutely no equivocation about that. It's clear. It's a basic trite learning. 102 talks about one type of quorum for conducting business. Not too far away from it, 103, 104, it talks about another quorum for taking decisions. 102 excludes the person who is presiding. 104 does not. So clearly, I mean, I've given you the legal yeah, principle. Yeah. Okay, and fair there are Supreme Court cases. So, so this satisfies the fact that he can be counted. He can be counted. So yes. when he said that 137 plus he me, be, MP for Bequire, yes, he was correct. It's very legally sound. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's no contention about that. Mm -hmm. And I've told you. There's contention on social media, though. There, there's a, the House of Commons rules. There are precedent decisions in the House of Commons and the, and the Parliament of of. of, of, of of Canada, which has determined these kinds of uh, issues before. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. But how will he, why, will, why will he not be counted? He's a member of parliament as mm -hmm. well. And he's entitled to represent the people of his constituency. Unlike the speaker, who is not a member of parliament, the first and second deputy speakers are members of parliament. So you are never to lose sight of the fact that they are members. So then it's just to say that any time there's an issue on the floor and the second, first deputy speaker or the second deputy speaker presides, the people of their constituency extinguish their constitutional right of representation. Mm -hmm. But that will make it totally in contravention with, with even the constitution. So the Article 104 and Article 102 read together, construed together, leads you to the only unavoidable conclusion that the sec first and deputy speakers, when they are presiding, are counted for purposes of establishing a quorum for decision taking. Will they be able to vote or not? Even before I get to that, the speaker did not vote today. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to vote. So he didn't participate in the voting. But will he be able to vote? I will say yes, he will be able to vote. Because if you go to Article... But, but look at 104, 2, or two That's what I'm going to. Yeah. If you go to Article 104, mm -hmm. 2, the speaker shall have neither an original nor casting vote. First of all, when you construe this whole constitution, and I mean, we don't have the time to do that here, I can get a brief for you. Mm -hmm. I, when you construe this whole uh, um, constitution, whenever the framers of the constitution talks about speaker, they refer to the speaker properly so-called. Oh, oh, hold on. Oh, yeah, go on. Uh -huh. Take Article 1 to the last article of this 1992 constitution. The framers of the Constitution keep using the language speaker, first deputy speaker, second deputy speaker, the person presiding. Mm -hmm. They never interchange them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, the canon of interpretation. If they intended the speaker to mean speaker, first deputy speaker, second deputy speaker, they would have used speaker throughout and come to the interpretation part and say speaker means mm -hmm. first deputy speaker. But they go on and on. Even Article 102, 104, 
They, they distinguish between the person presiding. presiding they don't say the speaker. speaker yeah. They don't say speaker. Say the person they presiding. say the person presiding. So the constitution so that, isolates roles so, and, so, and So people. that it could be the speaker presiding, he's excluded. It could be a first deputy speaker presiding, he's excluded. It could be the second deputy speaker presiding, he's excluded. Once you are presiding for the purpose of quorum for uh, conducting business, you are excluded. Mm. But it comes to 104 and it doesn't exclude the, the sec first and second deputy speaker. And I'm saying to you, the bigger issue is that when you take this constitution, the framers of the constitution are very deliberate in distinguishing between Mr. Speaker, first deputy speaker, second deputy speaker, the person presiding. Now, so, Paul, the, the, the jurisprudential underpinnings for that kind of construction is that the framers of the constitution recognizes that the speaker is not or cannot be a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. Even if you were a member of parliament and you contested, you contested for speakership, you have to resign. Mm -hmm. But they appreciate that the second and first deputy speakers may be members of parliament. Mm -hmm. May be members of parliament. And to the extent that they are members of parliament, the right of their constituents to representation ought not to be taken away by the mere fact that they are first and deputy speakers of parliament. So, in this particular vote, in this particular vote, if the speaker was required to vote, the, the first deputy speaker was required to vote, he would have been entitled to vote. So the point you are making here that in 1022... Or but he didn't three, vote in this In case. 1022 where they said that the speaker shall not retain his original vote or, or shall, the speaker shall, not, shall neither have an original vote or a casting vote, that reference to the speaker... Should mean, they mean the speaker. You mean the speaker. They mean the speaker. As and, opposed and, and to the first deputy speaker and the second deputy speaker. They mean the speaker. And, and look, Paul, they mean the speaker. That's what the, the framers of the Constitution mean. They mean the speaker. Uh, listen, Article 57 2. Mm -hmm. Okay. The president shall take precedence over all other persons in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And in descending order, the vice president, the speaker of parliament, and the chief justice shall take precedence over all other persons in Ghana. When they say the speaker of parliament, they mean the speaker of parliament. It does not include the president. No, they mean the speaker so of that parliament. If and, the, and, if and the president, so that if the president has traveled, the vice president has traveled, and the speaker has traveled, the first deputy speaker cannot be sworn in as president. It will be the chief no, justice. No, he cannot. Mm -hmm. The first deputy speaker can only be sworn in as president when he is voted to. Or he takes the position of the speaker, speaker. which is why, which is why Professor Kumado, uh, be, be, whatever he is, I salute him. He is the man who taught me the distinction of Article 57.2, the president mm -hmm. and the succession. Mm -hmm. In my constitutional law class, tell us where he said the the president in Article 57.2 mm -hmm. talks about president, vice president, speaker. Chief Justice 57.2, it talks about president. Then you go to Article 60 or so. I'm not too sure if it's Article 60, but it, 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 you go to a particular provision in the executive, Chapter 8, I think it's Article 60, where it talks about succession. And it says president, vice president, speaker, and it ends there. Well, it doesn't say Chief team. Justice. Mm. It doesn't say Chief Justice. And the, the principle of the tool of interpretation I just enunciated, which is why, which is that the framers, when they intended that the chief justice should be the fourth in terms of precedence in Article 57.2, they said so. When it came to succession, they ended succession as Succession being, if the president is they not there, the vice so president So if the president, president is not there, the vice president, then the speaker. the speaker. If the speaker is not there, the first deputy, first deputy speaker was sent to speakership and then become the acting over. president. If he's not there, the second deputy speaker will, will go in that ladder, not the chief justice. Now, there is a jurisprudential underpinning for that kind of arrangement mm -hmm. because the president is voted for, the speaker, to some extent, is voted for. Mm -hmm. Electoral college, by the way. Vicariously. Yeah, yeah, vicariously. He's voted yeah. for vicariously. By members of parliament the, the, who the, are themselves elected. The, the citizens elect the members of parliament, and the members of parliament go to elect the speaker. So he has a mandate of mm -hmm. a sort. Mm -hmm. So in terms of governing, mandate to govern, he has some... Oh, that's interesting. I get it. And, and, and that's the flow. But not the chief justice. The mm -hmm. chief justice appointed. I mean, it's he not, has no by popular no way, mandate. Uh, it's by no way uh, 
to reduce, to the, reduce the effects the relative. image or be a derogatory of the no but is that the jurisprudence of it mm -hmm. so my point is that when the framers of the country say speaker they mean speaker and in some places they say first deputy speaker they say second deputy speaker and then they say the the person presiding so the speaker the first deputy speaker and the second deputy speaker are accounted for purposes of establishing a quorum for decision making so do they have the right to vote also as members of parliament because they wear two hats mm. let's look at the questions from our young people over here uh, abdul let's start with you what question do you have thank you very much uh, i want to know on friday the finance minister spoke about making adjustments to some of the concerns that uh, were raised um, i want to know there's uh, this uh, rumors on social media that the 1.7 uh, percent uh, e levy has been slashed to one percent i want to know if that is true and secondly, uh, as students, we've heard that there's going to be a 15% increment in fees and other charges. Uh, most of our students are uh, complaining on campus. I want to know if uh, that has also been part of what is passed today. Um, so basically, that's my question. Please. Okay, let's, let's, let's let Minister take it here. Uh, has it been slashed, the, 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 parliament that was, the budget that was approved? Has there been a reduction of the 1.75 e-levy? Do you know? At this stage, there haven't been any revision of the budget. The budget that was passed is the budget as the finance minister presented to the parliament. Of course, as the finance minister himself indicated on the floor of parliament, we are going to now go through the committee stage of considering the various estimates and the various policies of the, of the budget. And when that is done, and at that stage, if there have to be any uh, discussions with a view of uh, getting the best outcome for the country, and so on and so forth. Why not? It should be done. The finance minister himself said so on the floor of parliament. But my good friend, it's important that I point out to you that this budget that was presented to parliament, that was presented to this country, is a budget that was thought through very, very seriously. It's not a budget that was thrown at the Ghanaian people uh, casually or recklessly. Or it's not a budget that was presented to the Ghanaian people out of insensitivity. I have the privilege of being a member of the cabinet. The cabinet met almost five, seven times with one retreat to cross the T's and dot the I's to get the best for our country. What we all have to appreciate, and you have to appreciate, and I appreciate your passion and the, the, the passion with which you've asked the question, and I know a good number of us young people across the country have all kinds of aspirations, have frustrations, and have difficulties in which the government has to work to resolve. The pandemic that we are coming out of it's hit the world so badly. The United Kingdom economy alone is contracted by 9.9%. It is the worst since the great frost of 1709. Their economy has never been contracted at that level before, 99 .9. The G7 countries, Japan, 3.7, United States, 3.5 or so, all G7 countries, their economies have contracted 25 million 25 million citizens of developed, the G7 developed countries are going to lose their jobs in this year. So we have a difficulty. There have been a, a, a lot of hemorrhage as a result of COVID-19. And we need a recovery. We need a recovery. We need to have a plan which will recover this economy, which will build infrastructure, which will crank the economy, which will bring about entrepreneurship, bring about enterprise, and who can unleash the hundreds and thousands and millions of jobs. And we need resources to do that. So my point to you, whichever happens as a result of um, the committee sittings and discussions and negotiations and what have you, I want you, and uh, in all respect, the uh, overwhelming majority of the Ghanaian youth, that this government and President Akufuad is very sensitive to your aspirations and sensitive to your issues. And this budget is actually intended to, 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 to work for you to be able to realize your aspirations, your aspirations of getting a job, having a decent life, unleashing prosperity into our country. We have to do that. The other option is to go on with business as usual. Revenue doesn't come in. A deficit is expanding. Inflation is skyrocketing. You have to go to IMF, like we did under the NDC administration, with all kinds of conditionalities. You cannot recruit into the, into the public sector. You cannot build the productive sectors of your economy. And then your economy grinds to a halt. This is a difficult time. This is a, 
uh, a time when we have to take difficult decisions. And your government, your president, is working to achieve just that so that we can have a recovery and bring back hope into our country. As you know, before COVID, the first quarter of 2020, we grew by 7%. GDP grew for 7%. So quite clearly, the measures the president had implemented pre-COVID were bearing results and we're achieving some great results for our country. That's for the politics and the propaganda and the rest. Nobody can take it away. That one is part of democracy. It's part of some people want to come to power. So whatever they have to do to make the government look bad and, 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 and lambast the government and criticize the government and make the government look insensitive, they will do so. But the hardcore truth and reality is that this budget, actually on the contrary, like it is with the you start, where we are telling the young men of our country that you just start. Start an enterprise, bring up an idea, start the expansion of your business, and government will meet you halfway. So fundamentally, this budget, on the contrary, seeks to engineer recovery and deal with the aspirations mm. and hopes okay. of the Ghanaian youth. That's what we seek to do, to okay. support us. Let me, let me just announce that uh, we, we, we are off uh, TV on social media now. Uh, Minister, there's a contention here about the standing orders, uh, that the standing orders is raising an issue about the the power of a deputy speaker to vote, as it were. Uh, but the, the, on the platform that I'm looking at now, there's... Order an, 1. Uh, order 109, I think. There's another contention that the standing orders are not law. They don't create obligations and limitations like the Constitution does. So have a look at uh, standing order 109. One. I know, yeah. 1093. It has something to say about deputy speaker. Whilst we take up those questions, and welcome uh, those of you who have to shift from TV and join us on social media. This turned out to be a very interesting conversation, so we are still here uh, and talking. Very short question, please. Uh, I'll take okay. both questions so you can leave, and then uh, he can answer it. Okay, so, uh, Honorable, one thing that the minority spoke about today in their press conference was that the finance minister had said that he was going to take their concerns into um, he was going to take a concerns about the budget and he was going to work on them and they had a concern that if indeed that was going to happen was that not supposed to be done were the corrections because they identified certain mistakes in their budget for instance in the budget the finance minister said that the support the refurbishment of the Sipon sports stadium was 90 percent complete whereas there's nothing close to that it has not even started so was those corrections not supposed to be done before the budget would have been approved and they also said that going forward now any decision that parliament is going to take they were going to call for a vote on the floor and knowing that a lot of the majority side have other businesses as ministers and are not going to be present always not going to be present on the floor of parliament is that not going to make things very difficult for government business when they are supposed to get certain things passed in parliament okay mikhail let's hear you and the minister will take both questions all right honorable minister thank you very much now i'm um, watching the happenings of last friday and today some of us get the impression that our mps are playing their own personal chess game with uh, serious issues so i just want to know if to your knowledge the constitution has provisions or parliament has standing orders which mandates that our members of parliament and our speaker must be present and sort of make it such that we have more constructive uh, uh, conflict resolution measures than staging walkout or boycotting uh, parliamentary procedures. Thank you. All right. Okay. So let's start with the other the, the gentleman's question first about yeah. corrections and uh, genuine mistakes that were in the budget. And shouldn't those corrections have been made? And then down the resolve of minority that they will re, they will demand any vote. And you, a minister, you have colleague ministers in parliament. You may not be there, so and you have only majority plus one. So that's going to be tough, wasn't it? Well, first of all, I think that the matters to do it. Uh, the inputs of the minority where uh, the, 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 there's a whole series of process of budget construction uh, which involves the input of a lot of stakeholders and that obviously was done but given that at the stage of the approval it turned out that the minority still had a lot of grievances and misgivings about the budget which is why the finance minister requested that he be given an opportunity to further engage the leadership of the House. Mm -hmm. uh, very unfortunately, that request was turned down. And I, I, I found that very disappointing because if the finance minister recognizes that there are grievances from the minority and there are uh, issues the minority wants addressed, mm -hmm. he himself comes forward to request for that opportunity. I think the least the House could have done was to grant him that opportunity. And let's see how that will work out. 
uh, as fate will have it, today, mm -hmm. that engagement took place, even though it did not yield the results that we would have desired. And uh, that engagement would have, could have happened at the time when he requested for an But now that they that resolved that they will not, they will well, put you to so, the vote so on everything. So my point is that uh, there's been that effort. The question about the minority not participating, I, I believe as time goes on, we will have to create an avenue or a framework for us to have a constructive engagement in the interest of the public. Paul, I think it's important I make one point. Mm -hmm. And that point is, Paul, whatever we do in this enterprise, we do it for the Ghanaian people. Mm -hmm. We do it for the good of our country. And all of us, politicians, president, vice president, speaker of parliament, chief justice, ministers, MPs, we serve at the behest of the good people of this country. And we are to, con our commissions and omissions are required to be in accord with what we call the public interest. The public interest ought to, at ma all material times, be the overriding consideration. So the minority have the capacity, they have the power. I don't underestimate that. I don't, uh, I'm not oblivious of that. It should be uh, fully on my part to think that the minority cannot be destructive or obstructionist. There's no two ways that they have it. They have the numbers, clearly, mm -hmm. in the House. They have 137, we have 138. So our majority is very fragile. So if they want to be obstructionist and destructive, they have the tools, they have the capacity to do so. They have the power to do so. But as I say, all of us, all of us work at the behest of the sovereign people of Ghana. All of us work, or all of us, our work must be, ought to be in accordance with the public interest. So we all have decisions to make. I, as member of parliament, have a decision to make. The, my colleague members of parliament, have decisions to make. Our various caucuses have decisions to make. I think that we need to continue to engage each other. And I believe out of that, we can smoothen out the rough edges and we can um, come to some reasonable, functional uh, relationship for us to be able to work together for the good of the country. Because, Paul, at the end of the day, when one group decides to be obstructionist and destructive and wants to torpedo everything and wants to make the country ungovernable and the rest. Where does that lead us to? Wh which entity, which corporate entity becomes the ultimate loser? Ghana. Mm -hmm. It's Ghana that ultimately become, becomes the loser. If, if this, uh, for instance, if the budget was not passed and if the appropriation bill is not passed, it will mean 1st of January next year Teachers cannot teach our children. Nurses cannot go to hospitals to look after us. Policemen cannot go on patrols. The presidency will not function. There will be no parliament. There will be no judiciary. There will be no sanitary workers. The country will grind to a halt. There will be no Ghana. We will have a dysfunctional country. Hmm. It, will be, it will be a chaotic Ghana. So if a group says we will frustrates the governance of the country to the point where the country becomes ungovernable and to the point where the country grinds on its knees. I think, I think we are all accountable to the Ghanaian people. And therefore, we will all have questions to answer before the Ghanaian people. And, and I'm confident and optimistic and hopeful that the minority will not take that path. Mm, I think okay. we still have a lot of room to jaw joy and to engage and for us to be able to Come to, uh, come to some reasonable understanding to do business together. That shouldn't be beyond that. And that we do for the good of our country, for the forward march of our country. We don't do it for ourselves. We don't do it for our political parties or political considerations. We do it for the ultimate good of the Ghanaian people. Let me take the last round of questions from you. Yes, Matilda, you first. Paul, kindly ask Honorable Jinapo to explain Article 109, Clause 3 in particular, because most people have attributed the interpretation to another illegality conducted by Honorable Joe Weiss. Okay, he's checking it. Go on. Alvin Johnson says, Good evening, Paul. Please let's be realistic on the issue on our current budget in Parliament. 
Article 102 excludes the speaker and 104 includes the speaker. What about the standing order 109 clause 3? We need answers to this as well because the lies to pass this budget is unhealthy to our country called Ghana. Abraham, if Kobe says, please, I beg, try and, re and reduce it for 1.75 to at least 1%, because already we are charged 1% for withdrawal and 1% for transferring from account to account. This one then, and I do something. Uh, Alfred Tamako says there is a distinction between majority of all members of parliament present and majority of members of parliament present. In this instance and in particular case, which is in reference to Article 104, the constitutional imperative requirement is the latter, namely majority of members of parliament present. There are no nuances, it is very expressed. Okay, also from Ayusu Roja Johnson. Good evening, Ghana. The law says half of the members present and voting. I want to understand something. Is it that, is, does that mean if you would not vote, it means you don't form a part of the half of the members present? Alfred Tamakro says, is it not a responsibility even a legal, a legal bar of the person presiding, whether the substantive speaker or his or her deputy or any other member of the house, not to vote, whether this responsibility or legal bar is in respect of Article 104 or 102. Otherwise, how does the Constitution cure any bias of the person presiding on the question conflict of interest in voting which is cured in the case of the substantive speaker, also known as the speaker? Ram Singh Dajua says, Paul, I want to know if the minority had stayed on the floor and the count becomes 137, 137. What would have been the outcome? Okay, also from Nana Owusu, the NPP government's innovative approach of raising internally generated funds is the best way forward. The NDC is fully aware that this will be a game changer for the country, hence the stiff opposition. Indeed, they will stay in opposition for a decade or more. Dash Stinkon says the tax is good, but the tariff is high. Governments must explain why the tariff is so high. Gabriel elect Yabua says, I may be wrong, Paul, but I don't think the speaker is on school about the standing orders of parliament. My question though, what punitive measures are set for parliament in matters like this, or they can just take us for a ride? Okay, James Brown also says, solid presentation by the Honorable Samuel A. Janapo. When we say we have the men, we do not mean men with muscles who can kick away ballot boxes, but men whose intellect can strike you more than a punch. And then also from Kwekujia Jr., Padum Otre kindly asked him about if the acting MP Joe Wise could count himself as part of the MPs before putting the questions to the plenary. Okay, who deals with that? Uh, go on, go on, Christine. Mahama Alasan says, We appreciate the MP and Minister Samuel A. Jinapo for his time in attempting to explain in details the recent happenings in Parliament, a legal and fine brain by all standards. Said Benjamin says, Listening to this brilliant submission by lawyer Samuel Abu Jinapo, I can confidently say without equivocation that the minority in parliament, led by Sumana Bagwin, the speaker, is deliberately misleading their followers. Well, either that or they are knowledgeably insufficient and incompetent to interpret the articles this brilliantly. Thanks for the crystal clear education, MP for Damango constituency. Well, Mr. Speaker is not the leader of the minority, he's the speaker. The leader of the minority is. Uh, Honorable Haruna Idris, the Member of Parliament for Tamale South. But uh, we have past 11, so people have been enjoying our program. We thank all of you who have been watching. Text messages are coming in, especially from Ghanaians abroad. Those in America say they've had to stop work and uh, take their laptops and watch what's happening. It looks as if there's a lot of hope for our country, Honorable uh, Minister. I find that the Ghanaian diaspora, the level of their interest in things that are happening in Ghana is, is such, such an amazing and, uh, 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 you know, um, patriotic and they, they are very interested you know we didn't used to see that before people travel and they, they write of ghana but today people are sending me that they've had to stop work in america this afternoon and they are all watching they are very interested so maybe uh, let's hope for the the country well, maybe your government has brought some hope for the future yeah but but the thing about it also is that they are a very important constituency mm -hmm. you are never to underestimate that they are very very important constituency both in terms of numbers and in terms of their contribution to our national economy. Mm -hmm. And I would think that if you find yourself in that kind of situation, 
you must be interested in the happenings of your country. Mm, mm. And, 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 so, uh, so what's your last word? What's your last word? How well, my, my last word would be that, look, we've um, really tested our democracy, particularly the... The people parliament. in Canada, they are led by Abeku. Uh, the people in Canada, Abeku and Ku, they say I have to mention their names. Abeku and his friends from Canada, 17 of us are watching one laptop. Uh, Honorable Minister, you are doing well. Make Ghana great for us. We want to come back home. Yeah. Okay. They That's come, Canada. They should come and help build the country. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, we've tested our democracy. We've tested uh, uh, a lot of the practice procedures, conventions, uh, rules, and the constitutional provisions governing parliamentary work. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's uh, a feather in the cap of our democratic evolution, and, and, and that for me is very welcoming. We shouldn't at all uh, feel that something untoward has happened. The events that have taken place go to strengthen Ghanaian democracy and set good precedents and gives us a good learning curve. I believe at this stage uh, we, we should find uh, the proper framework or avenue to engage uh, as stakeholders and actors in the polity of our country. Uh, the minority is a very important group in our democracy. There's no two ways about that. You cannot wish them away. You cannot disregard them. And whatever views they have ought to be listened to. Okay, so please make ready the montage, the NDC montage. Yeah, That's how we'll end. Please make it ready. They don't, uh, I mean, they, they are not conclusive. I believe that the finance minister presented a very uh, solid budget in the context of the difficulties we find ourselves in as a country and in the context of where we need to take the country to, the rapid recovery we need in record time to be able to bring about jobs for the Ghanaian youth. The biggest headache of President Akufuado is the joblessness and unemployment situation in this country. The president, as you know, has created a whole lot of jobs in his first term, as you know, he inherited a backlog of unemployed youth as a result of our decision to go to the IMF with all the conditionalities relating to public sector employment freeze, which gave us a backlog of Ghanaian youth who did not have employment. And the president has been dealing with that in his first term all through to the uh, first year of his second term. And the statistics are there. But there are a good number of Ghanaian youth out there who still don't have jobs. And this budget, in addition to other measures that government is putting in place, are all geared towards cranking up the economy, delivering the recovery in record time, and getting the economy growing again so that we can create the hundreds and thousands and millions of jobs for the Ghanaian people. The Youth Start is a bold initiative by the government, a bold initiative by President Akufuado, where every year the government is providing a counterpart funding of one billion Ghana cities and is going to source funding from World Bank, from international financial institutions, from commercial banks, to create a pool of capital to support Ghanaian youth in entrepreneurship. So that whatever you are doing, if you are into IT and you have a small IT consultancy firm, government is coming to support you with capital so they can expand. If you are into delivery services, government is coming to give you capital to expand. Or if you have an idea to start a business, to start an enterprise, the Youth Start program to support you to be able to start. And what our President Akufuado is telling the Ghanaian youth is that just start. You just start. Whatever idea you have, start. And everywhere in the world, whether it's in Singapore, Malaysia, or UK, what young people look up for is that their government and the state will partner them and will come and support them in their time of need. So this budget seeks to promote entrepreneurship and create prosperity and jobs, particularly for the youth of our country. Yes, we all have our views, and nobody likes to pay taxes, Franklin. Uh, Franklin, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin said the two certain matters of life are death and taxes. Those you can't escape. <laughs> that you die is certain. Mm -hmm. And that you pay taxes is certain. Mm -hmm. But this is where we are. Uh, we have a difficulty. So there must be burden sharing. And we must all sacrifice a bit for us to get to the destination. So I want to uh, thank your viewers and to uh, call on the Ghanaian people, particularly the youth of our country, to support this budget. And I want to also uh, appeal to my friends in the minority side 
that look, we, 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 we should, we should uh, join forces and join hands to build this country because it's all, the only country we have. If we go on and on and on and render the country ungovernable, we all, and Ghanaians, will be the ultimate losers, and we don't want that. So let us continue to support this budget. It's such good news that at long last the parliament has passed the budget. The committees are going to begin sitting, I think, from tomorrow, and there, whatever tweaking, additions, and subtractions which ought to take place will take place. The estimates will come to the, the, the House, and they will be determined, and then the appropriation bill will be brought before the House for us to take a decision on it. <coughs> Always one Ghana. Mm, okay. Thank you. That's Samuel Abu Jnapo, Member of Parliament for Damango and Minister for Lands and Forestry. We will not take much of your time. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition. We'll be back on Thursday. It's good evening, Ghana. Good night. Because there have been a walkout, I want a head count. So that we get to know the number in the House and whether we satisfy the constitutional requirement of taking a decision, which we know the core of the House will take a decision. Quorum of the House. Please, table office, do the counting. Honorable members, you may now resume your seats. The results. 137. <laughs> The results, 137. Oh, Lord.